Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first class in um, the Spiritual Foundations of Emotional Healing uh, for our 2018 uh, Emotional Healing class. Tonight, I want to talk about how I got started in emotion, what I call emotional healing, which is really actually spiritual healing, but I didn't ever call it that because I didn't want to scare people off. Um, and I'm going to give you two key lessons I learned right from the very start that have guided me throughout this work. We'll elaborate on those and add some other um, keys that go along with them in later lessons, but uh, these two are the, the, the most important things to remember. So all of this started in 1986, which was a really monumental year for me. I started teaching a school called Manager School for Nature Sunshine Products. Um, the year I got involved in constitutional iridology is also the year I started um, doing emotional healing work. So I, when I was putting together the Manager School for Nature Sunshine, I, um, I woke up one morning about a week before the first class was to start. And there was just still a lot of things to do to get ready for that class. And I had a touch of diarrhea and I felt nauseous, sick to my stomach, like I wanted to throw up. But I knew I couldn't stay home because I had to get work done. And I was thinking that it was maybe something I ate the night before. But when I got to the office, I felt so horrible that I just actually closed the door and laid on the floor. And while I was sitting there bemoaning my fate, I um, thought of an article I had read in a, in, a, in a book that was a collection of articles about holistic healing and that had correlated certain uh, symptoms with certain uh, emotional states. And so I thought, hmm, I wonder what it would say about what I'm going through. And I turned to uh, diarrhea and it said this person has... Uh, sees themselves faced with a meaningful event and wishes it was over with and done. <laughs> I looked at that and thought, wow, that's the mentor school start next week. I, I wish I was already and I wish I was past that, you know, getting the first class done. And I flipped over and looked at the nausea and vomiting and said, this person has done something they wish they hadn't done and wishes they could go back and undo it. And I knew that was something that related to a family matter I was having. And I thought, wow, the, those descriptions perfectly match what's going on inside of me right now. And so I had learned to go into a quiet meditative state. So I went into that quiet meditative state. I, I worked through both of these issues in my mind, basically telling myself, you know, that the, the school next week was going to go fine. It was going to be great, blah, blah, blah. The issue with my family was, was not a big problem and would easily be resolved. And... 15 story 15 minutes later I got up the floor no symptoms feeling absolutely perfectly fine and this really I mean I knew there was a connection between our feelings and our attitudes and our health issues but I had never realized how powerful it could be that just changing your mind could affect your body in such a profound way and I put it in the back of my head, a kind of a thought and a prayer that I wanted to figure out more about this. Well, I really believe in the principle, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, and knocking it shall be opened unto you. Because in my life, when I start putting that kind of idea in the back of my head that I want to know this, I find myself being led to resources that actually help me uh, achieve those things. And so I... Um, it was about uh, six months later that I was visiting some friends of mine and they said that they were uh, had been doing this interesting work with people and asked me if I'd be interested in trying it. And I said, um, okay, I'll, uh, um, I'll see, you know, what you do. I'm kind of game to trying things, especially when it's someone that I know, it's a friend of mine. So they had me lie on the floor and uh, the, the wife was at my feet, the husband was at my head, and he kind of uh, had this gift of being able to kind of look at someone and kind of get a visual picture of what was going on with them. And so he said, I see like your body is filled with all this light and energy, but at your under where your belly button is in your navel, it's all tangled up like a jumble of tangled wires. Can you go in there and see what that tangle is all about? 
And I thought that's really interesting. So I pictured that in my head. I pictured this like bundle of tied up things in my abdomen. And I went in to like, like you do when you've got a, a, a extension cord or something else that's tangled up and you try to unwind it. And I, as I hit the first kind of naughty thing in it, my mind suddenly bounced to something that happened a week or two before. And my friend said, what's happening? And I said, I don't want to talk about it. And <laughs> she said, uh, no, you, you, you can trust us. You can, uh, whatever, just we're friends. And I said, well, I'm in bed with my wife. She says, well, you can talk about it, but just be discreet. And I said, well, I'm kind of interested in being intimate. She's not, and I'm feeling very rejected and upset and so forth. So, um, she asked me to visualize Christ coming on that scene and, and you know, what, what he would say about the thing. And I, you know, that kind of, and I, I don't remember the exact thing that happened there, but I had this resolution. And no sooner had I done that, that it was like, I, in my mind, I slid down to the next knot. And when I touched that knot, I remembered an incident that happened uh, many years ago. In fact, I, I remembered, um, the, the, the three most important things that I remembered were, um, number one, a um, time when my mom had uh, been very upset with my younger brother and I and had actually chased us around our bedroom with a belt trying to hit us because she was angry with us. And when uh, she had actually, I think, succeeded in hitting me over the head and she'd cornered us and had us standing in front of her and I was crying and she told me to stop crying or she was going to hit me again. So I stuffed my tears back and everything because I didn't want to have more pain. And um, my friend said, stop. Okay. Um, the belt has turned into something that can't hurt you. And I saw it like it was just a piece of cotton or something like that, that wouldn't hurt and then went through a similar thing jesus coming and and uh, taking control of the situation and i i i felt that love and love for her love for my mom love for me she says everything okay and i said okay and went back to another instance which happened when i was five my my mom had uh emotional problems my mom was uh borderline schizophrenic she wasn't she was uh, functioning. She wasn't like uh, where she couldn't function, but certain things would trigger her into kind of episodes where she would um, say really crazy things and say, you know, and get really emotionally upset and so forth. And she had been in the mental hospital twice for this. And, and the, the, the second time was when I was five years old. And I had gone to live with my aunt, uh, Maureen, for several months been stuck in another kindergarten, which was very frustrating because I didn't know any of the kids there and I was kind of an outsider and so forth. And then I, uh, my dad found someone to watch us um, when uh, we came home from school. Uh, we're watching actually to watch the, the um, my brother and sister and, and they were younger than I was and, and so forth. So um, but what happened is I'd come home from school and there were some kids who'd come over in the yard and they started teasing me and threatening me and so forth. And so I ran inside the house and I was in the upstairs bedroom and they were taunting at me. And I asked this person who was taking care of us, you know, to go out and make them go away so I could play in the yard and she wouldn't do it. She just sat there and watched TV. And, um, and I, I, I felt very like not supported. You know, my mom wasn't there, that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, process that particular experience. And then the next thing that happened was the thing that was the most remarkable to me. And the whole key that set me off on emotional healing. This was like following, a, you understand, this is like following a thread, a theme back through my life to its origins. And when I hit the, the end, of the, the thing, I was floating in darkness. 
And my my friend was trying to say, you know, like it was something bad. And I, I said, no, it's not bad. It's actually very pleasant. I feel very good. I'm happy. Not a problem, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, they felt this tremendous pressure, like I was being squished from all sides. And, and then all of a sudden, the sense of pain, the sense that I was choking, um, and this realization hit me, and I blurted out, I'm being born, and I don't like it. It hurts. Nobody told me it was going to be like this. And um, my, I had known, my mom had told me that the uh, umbilical cord had been wrapped around my neck three times um, when I was being born, and I had a very difficult and traumatic birth. And it was only the skill of our uh, family pediatrician that had saved me from dying um, in childbirth. And um, so that kind of made sense that, you know, the being born would have been a very difficult, painful experience. But um, it was surprising to me that I could actually, that I was actually remembering the experience of being born because it's like you think that an infant doesn't really have that kind of awareness, but they do. In fact, in doing emotional healing work, I subsequently learned that uh, people have gone back and remembered things that, that happened when they were in the womb. So um, ch children have, we have inside of us the memory of everything that's ever happened to us um, through our entire life, including uh, when we began life in the womb. It's, it's there. All of those memories are, are stored somewhere in our subconscious mind. And then I had this sensation of being uh, getting into this really bright light and uh, and again, being in pain. And then suddenly I was whisked away and I was in this little box looking up at the ceiling. Well, likely I was stuck in an incubator, right? Or some kind of thing for observation. And I said, um, they've taken me away from my mother and I'm all alone and nobody loves me and nobody wants me. And at that point, um, my friend said, we're never alone. Someone is there to help you. And this was the most vivid experience at all. In the other ones, I was just kind of imagining that Jesus came into the scene. But in this one, it was like he actually literally came into the scene. It was like a vision. It wasn't like a, an imagination or a whatever. It was like vividly real. And he leaned over the little incubator I was sitting in or lying in or the little box or whatever it was that they had me in. And he reached down and he touched me here. And when he did, I had an incredible experience. I have read about people in um, near-death experiences going through what they call a life review where they they see their entire life present before them as if it's all happening now in the, the same period of time. I, I've read a number of near-death experiences and people describe this phenomenon of seeing their entire life before their eyes simultaneously. Well, I had what I would call a mini life review. It wasn't my entire life, but it was my entire life around this one issue. And what I saw was, is that because I had um, had this very painful experience at birth and felt very abandoned, okay, and not wanted, and because subsequently my mother with her emotional problems had not been very emotionally available and it, you know, I'd been separated from her at a very vulnerable age and all this sort of thing, that this had become inside of me a self-fulfilling prophecy that if my mom didn't love me and my mom didn't want me, no woman could ever love me. Now, I knew that deep down inside, I felt that way. In fact, I had actually talked to a counselor about that. I had actually tried affirmations to try to change this. You know, somewhere in the world, there's somebody who, you know, <laughs> would be the right person for you that would love you. But you know, I, there was some part of me that I could never convince that that was true. No matter how hard I tried to do affirmations, there was just this pain inside that said, you're not lovable by someone of the opposite sex. And I saw that this had originated, you know, from these early experiences that I had 
highlighted through boom, boom, boom. Um, but I also saw, okay, a very interesting thing. One, I saw my mom love me. In, in spite of her emotional problems, she did love me and she she did want me and there was that wasn't really a problem. But more importantly, I actually saw women in my life who had been attracted to me. Um, I saw this girl named Margot Pia who had teased me incessantly in the ninth grade and I saw that she had this big crush on me, but I couldn't perceive that she had a crush on me. Um, I thought she was, I thought she didn't like me, okay? But I, so I couldn't understand that she, why she was teasing me. I thought she was teasing me because she just she didn't like me. But it was actually because she liked me, and I couldn't I couldn't see it. And I saw um, this woman in college. Um, this uh, I think her name was Joyce. She was a beautiful blonde lady who was majoring in outdoor recreation, and I loved the outdoors. I loved to go hiking. I loved to go camping. I loved nature. Uh, this uh, young woman liked my poetry and so forth. And um, she, uh, I, I consider her a friend um, and what you would call out of my league. All right. Um, so I really liked her, but I, I couldn't see this. So, but anyway, I, she had never been to a, a, a conference of uh, the church I belonged to at the time. And I, I mentioned to her, my family lives in Salt Lake. Maybe, you know, my parents would probably let you stay in one of the spare bedrooms if you wanted to, because we had we had a bedroom that wasn't being used because my sister was away. Um, and my brother, I think my sister was already in college. My brother was uh, away also. And I said, so if you want to, we could go up and um, and you could go to the conference. And she said, sure. And while we were up there in Salt Lake, I um, was invited by someone I had known in Southern California who was up in Salt Lake um, to go out to dinner with he and his wife and other, some other people. And as we were at this dinner, my uh, friend from Southern California, who by the way, had a family that I think was the most amazing family I'd ever seen, you know, as far as not having contention and being just this wonderful, loving family. He, he took me aside and he said that, girl adores you and she's the perfect wife from wife for you and you should ask her to marry you and i said no we're just friends and i saw that what he said was true and what i believed wasn't but i couldn't perceive it i couldn't perceive it because i didn't believe that it was possible and that was just this incredible blinding revelation to me. I mean, it was like it was like this light bursting on my consciousness. And the scripture came to my mind, we see through a glass darkly. We know in part, we prophesy in part, you know, because we see. And I knew what the dark glass that we were looking through was. It was our beliefs that we could not believe something was if we couldn't believe that something was possible we wouldn't see it in fact i've often told people um seeing isn't believing believing is seeing the ability to believe is the ability to perceive what is not only there but what's also possible and if you don't believe you can't perceive in fact i've learned in communications classes that um We have selective attention, selective perception, and selective retention, meaning that we pay attention to what conforms to our existing beliefs. We twist what we see to make it conform to our existing beliefs. And we retain what supports our existing beliefs. Well, at the same time, we don't pay attention to what doesn't support our beliefs. We, we, we you know, avoid interpreting things in a way that would challenge our beliefs, and we avoid remembering things that would challenge our beliefs. In other words, our beliefs control the kind of information that we allow into our mind. And therefore, when we, when we read in the scriptures about you know, blindness of mind, our beliefs, our negative, self-limiting beliefs blind us to the possibilities. Now, I, I, 
I think, you know, we all, we always think in, in, um, you know, as people who are Christian and believe in God, that, that, Belief is a good thing, and it is a good thing, except for one thing. We don't we don't understand exactly what we mean by belief. Because most people think belief is mental acceptance of certain ideas. And that's not really, I think, what the scriptures are talking about when they talk about believing. Because if Jesus says, All things are possible to him that believeth, what that means is, is that is that anything that we perceive as a limitation in our lives, anything, uh, whether it be sickness or problems in our family or, or economic problems or anything else like that, if we believe that they can be overcome, our minds will open to the information and the, and the solutions and the things that God can present to us that will allow us to overcome them. But if we don't believe it's possible, we will never ask, we will never seek, we will never knock, and we will never learn. We'll be stuck where we are. And so this is, this is the first big lesson I learned about emotional healing, is that our beliefs control what we are able to achieve in our life. If we have a self-limiting belief operating inside of us, we will think, how do you, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's what it is, okay? Meaning that because you believe it, it will be true for you in your life. And you will not be able to see that it could be anything different. It, believing is, is a paramount to opening up to the possibility that what you think right now isn't so and that there's something that could happen that would fix it and make it better. In fact, I would, I would present this idea to you. You know, I, I often have heard Christians say, well, I'm saved. And even when I was younger, the, the question I always wanted in my mind was saved from what? And I think a lot of people would say, well, I'm saved from hell, you know, or I'm you know, I'm going to go to heaven kind of thing. But I think Jesus saves in a much more immediate way. Jesus has the power to save us in this life, not just in the next life. Many people are living in their own little private hell. They're suffering. They're, they, they've got family problems, they've got health problems, they've got financial problems, they've got all these problems and challenges, and they're suffering immensely over all of this. And what I'm saying is Jesus has the power to save us from these things, to, to save us from all these problems and from all our internal suffering now, here, now, not in the next life, but here, now. Jesus came so that we would have life and have it more abundantly not what happens after life but what happens here in life and this is what emotional healing is is really about is bringing in that power that power of a higher awareness from christ that opens us up to the possibilities of believing in things we didn't believe before were possible and when we start to believe something new our entire life will shift. And me, uh, something I had struggled with my entire life of believing that someone, that there would be some woman out there who would be attracted to me and love me, was in an instant changed. Split second. <laughs> All of the thing, I, everything I have just described to you that I saw and went through happened instantly. It was not, I, I have to explain it linearly, but I saw it instantly in a split second all at once and understood. And I knew that women could like me because I saw women who had liked me in my life. All right? So the blinders were taken off my eyes. The dark glass was removed from my eyes and I saw the truth. And once you see the truth, all right? You, it, it takes an act of deliberate will to go back to blindness, 
you know, to the blindness of mind that you were in before. Because now that you see the truth, you're set free. You're no longer held in the bondage of that negative, self-limiting belief. And I was amazed. I was literally absolutely stunned and amazed. And as I was flying home, I was sitting there, God, how is that possible? How, how can something that I have struggled with for years and years and years and tried and tried and tried to, to work with can be healed in a split second? Boom, and it's gone. And he, he, the Spirit said to me, evil works in darkness. And that which is in darkness in us, mankind, in other words, works for evil. But nothing um, can be evil which is brought into the light. For all things are made pure in the light. Therefore, the righteous seek the light, and in it they are healed. And the wicked shun the light, because they will not that their works be made known. Now, that was the words, but with this came this understanding that inside of me were feelings of pain, pain due to things that I had experienced in the past. And that what I did as a human being is I, didn't, I don't like to feel that pain and, and I didn't know how to process it or work through it or whatever. So what I had done is encapsulated it and the memories that were associated with it and shoved it into the depths of my subconscious and said, I'm not going to deal with this. <laughs> suppress, suppress, suppress. But because it was suppressed and because I wasn't aware of it, it was still operating inside of me, affecting how I saw the world, how I behaved, how I acted, and so forth. And therefore, as long as it remained in darkness, shoved away inside of me, it affected me in a negative way and affected my life in a negative way, in an evil way. But if I was willing to go in and look at the pain, look at the hurt, look at the acknowledgement, look at the, um, and this is, this is the key about the emotions, understand? If I was willing to go in and experience the emotional pain, the anger, the fear, the grief, the sadness, the whatever, and take a look at it and then let God help me with it. Bring it into the light and say, God, I've got this pain inside of me. I've got this fear inside of me. I've got this anger inside of me. I've got this resentment inside of me. I've got this whatever inside of me. Help me with it. That I bring it into the light, God could take it away. Boom. And it's gone. But as long as I was running away from it, as long as I was trying to deny it, as long as I was trying to suppress it, as long as I was trying to pretend it wasn't there, it was going to haunt me forever. And that was the second big realization that put me on this path of emotional healing. Because from that point on, I did something that is radically, and I'm talking about radically against everything that kind of society tells us to do, which is to say that feelings are important. They're not just to be suppressed. They're not just to be shoved inside. They're to be looked at and dealt with. And that when we take a look at them and are willing to go inside and really f squarely face them, we can move past them and the blocks that they're creating in our ability to perceive the truth. Now, I, I, I'm going to get more in this you know, course into what I learned subsequently about the nature of emotions. But when I, I started emotional healing work, I really, I, I'm gonna tell about my first emotional healing experience in a later thing, but I just right now wanna to touch on the fact that, the, that it was in the end of 1986 that God called me to do my first emotional healing work with somebody else. I was trying to help somebody with a physical health problem. And as I was working on it, she started, tears started to well up in her eyes. And she says, what's happening to me? And I said, well, there can be these emotional issues behind 
a physical health problem and we have to face them. And I told her about my experience. And she looked at me and she said, you have to do this for me. And I went, I don't know how, because I don't, I don't know how my friend got the impression of what was going on inside of me and got me triggered into going doing this. I have no idea how, how he did that. I had no idea how to, how to help her identify where to begin or whatever. And, and she says, no, you don't understand. You have to do this for me. And the spirit said to me, yes, you do. I'm like, okay, God, I don't know what to do. God said, I'll teach you. And I went in armed with only one understanding that I had to help her look at the emotions inside of her that she wasn't addressing. That was all I knew. Nothing more than that. And I don't even remember how I talked to her. I said, okay, just, just start talking. And I, and as, she, as you know, she's talking, I, I, I started this quest, line of questioning and how did that make you feel? And how did that make you feel? And how did that make you feel? And that is the big key to this whole thing is going again and again to the feelings, the feelings, the feelings, not the story, not what's up here in the head, but what's down here in the heart. What is she feeling? What is she feeling? What is she feeling? Go back into that situation. What is she feeling? And, uh, and that, you know, led to next year I did, did several, you know, several more and I started doing this and, and I'll, I'll tell you more about how that all started then. But just that fact that I understood that you have to look at your feelings, you can't run away from them, was all God gave me to start with. So I'm giving it to you tonight, okay? Feelings are important. And I'm gonna explain just briefly why, okay? As, as we talk, you'll, you'll more and more understand why feelings are important. But I wanna explain why in just the, the, the way that I finally, after years and years, have come to understand this. Because what, okay, what happened is, is, is as I was starting to do this, the first year I started to do this, I, I was going into this world of feeling that I had never even realized was there and its connection to the spiritual aspect of our nature. And I felt like I, I, I was in elementary school as far as understanding what is going on. And yet I was working on people who were in kindergarten or preschool. And so it was okay. All right. I mean, that's, that's how ignorant I felt once I went into this. I was like shooting blind, being led totally by the spirit as to what to do. But it, I understood it from a, from a standpoint that I had in physical healing, one of the first things that God had opened to my mind was that symptoms were not disease. See, because people tend to think like, um, I just encountered this weekend, my wife was down in Las Vegas with her mom and, and somebody else was, somebody that was down there, you know, had a fever, was feeling sick and her, her uh, mom wanted to give this person Tylenol to bring the fever down. And, her, and my wife didn't want that because she understood, like I do, that the fever is actually the body fighting the infection. And if you bring down the fever, you're actually interfering with what the body's trying to do to fight the infection. Or when you're having a runny nose or a cough, this is the body fighting the disease, a rash is the body fighting the disease. All of these symptoms are the result of the body fighting the disease. And so I quit trying to use you know, herbal medicine to suppress symptoms, to make the cough stop, to dry up the runny nose, to bring down the fever. You know, in other words, I quit thinking allopathically and started thinking in terms of what is the body trying to do? It's trying to flush out an irritant, you know, fight something off, activate the immune system. How do I help it do what it's trying to do instead of how do I fight against what it's trying to do? In other words, I learned to try to trust the innate wisdom that God had put in the body, that the body knew how to heal. And all I had, all I needed to do was support what the body was trying to do. And that's, and I, and I had been doing that for six years and um, really had come to see that it worked really well. So when this happened with emotions, I realized, well, we're always practicing emotional allopathy on each other. We're always telling, you know, our children, you know, don't be angry, don't cry, don't be afraid, don't, 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 don't. We're always trying to suppress the symptom. The emotion is just the symptom. 
It's not the problem. It's what the what the soul, if you will, the, the psyche, the spiritual part of us, is trying to do to solve the problem. It's it's alerting us to the fact that we've got a problem in our soul. All right. And we need to understand what that emotion is trying to do to say to us about what's going on in our soul and how to fix it. And if we are trying to suppress the emotion and deny that it's there, we're not getting the message from our soul about what's wrong and what we need to do to heal. And I understood this on a very deep intuitive level because I realized it was a parallel between the physical healing and the, the healing of our soul. In other words, when we feel angry, when we feel afraid, when we feel whatever, it's saying somehow there's something inside of us that needs to be looked at and fixed, all right? And suppressing the symptom, you know, trying to make the anger or whatever go away isn't going to fix the problem. But if you tune into it, it'll take you to the problem. It'll take you to the source so you can look at it and deal with it. So if you, if, I don't know if any of you are acquainted with the idea of a vision quest, but a lot of native people did vision quests. Um, sort of like, uh, you know, um, when Jesus went for 40 days and, you know, 40 nights to fast and pray in the wilderness, um, there, this has been done, it was done by Moses and there are other people who've done it too. But the idea here, uh, one, one form of vision quest that I read about in Native American um, uh, ritual was that you went out and you basically drew a circle 10 feet around and you took water with you and you stayed in that circle for three days fasting, uh, just drinking water and uh, leaving the circle only to go to the bathroom and then come back. Do you know what would happen if you did that? You would have to face what's inside of you. You'd have no choice. You couldn't run away from yourself anymore. It would force you to confront your inner demons. And most people are spending the bulk of their life and energy trying to run away from themselves. Well, guess what? There is one person you will never escape. It's you. You can never get away from you. And you can, you can numb your emotions and your emotional pain with drugs and alcohol and overeating and sex and all kinds of other physical things like that, 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 that kind of dull your body and dull your consciousness and so forth, which, which is what exactly what all these things do. Alcohol, drugs, overeating, um, excessive sexual activity, all this stuff, you know, uh, especially promisc promiscuous sexual activity, all it does is just distract you and temporarily numb or dull your pain. That's why pe people do it. But you could, you also do it by just constantly being busy, 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 having the radio going, looking on your cell phone, playing on your computer, blah, 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 watching TV, so that you're never, ever, ever have to be alone with yourself. Because if you're alone with yourself, all those feelings that you're not wanting to feel will come bubbling up to the surface and you'll have to face them. They'll start wanting to come to the light. They'll start wanting to be healed, to be acknowledged, to be looked at. But we're terrified of that. We're terrified of feeling those things because we've been taught to be terrified of feeling those things and everybody else around us is terrified of feeling it too. We don't know how to handle it. We don't know what to do. That's why I said, when I started doing this, I felt like I was in elementary school, you know, first or second grade, trying to help the kindergartners and preschoolers with our emotions. Because, because who, who have we ever had in our life who actually helped us understand how to work through our own feelings and then just tell us to, to suppress them or to blame them on you know, circumstances of our life or other people? Those are basically the two strategies to get rid of them, make everybody else responsible for them so that you can blame it on them. Then you don't have any responsibility for it. It's their fault. They, they need to change. You're not going to be happy until they change. Or just pretend you don't feel it. 
And that is a problem because when you're, as we'll learn more about in this course, when you cut yourself off from your feelings, you're cutting yourself off from he being able to hear the still small voice of the spirit. You have to confront your inner demons in order to overcome them. And you don't have to confront them alone. I mean, obviously, the whole, the whole point of this thing is that Jesus has the power to help you confront them and overcome them to save you from yourself. Okay, to save you from that part of you that you don't want to acknowledge right here, right now, today. There's that capacity to do that. So I want to, again, reiterate the two basic lessons I learned to start with. One, okay, that feelings are important, that we have to confront and feel our feelings because as long as we're suppressing them, they work inside of us against our best interests. But if we bring them into the light and ask God, in other words, we acknowledge them, we feel them, we stop blaming them on other people, we stop running away from them, we go in and we squarely acknowledge I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm whatever, okay, and feel it. And then we turn to God for help. He has the capacity to come in and change that around. And it's changed around by changing what we believe. Because a belief is a thought connected to a strong emotion. And when that gets decoupled, because you deal with the emotion, then a new thought can come in. And with the new thought, the new emotion comes in and forms a new belief. And our life can change like that. Like that. Like that. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is miraculously solved in your life or whatever, but your whole life alters course in a split second and you're on a different path. And that's what I call emotional healing. So again, acknowledging the emotions and two, recognizing and changing the belief systems, which are the thoughts that are in our head that are attached to those emotions. So your assignment, for this first lesson. I'm going to open up for questions and, and answers here in a moment. But your assignment for this first lesson, I'm giving you assignments. Of course, I'm not going to grade you. Nobody's going to hold over you. I'm just telling you some suggestions of how to start applying this information in your own life. Because, because the more you do this for yourself, the easier it becomes to do for other people. Because as you learn to work through what's inside of you, it becomes very easy to help other people work through what's inside of them. It's really the principle that Jesus said, remove the two by four from your own eye, and then you can see clearly to remove the dust speck from your neighbor's eye. This work is about removing the two by fours from our own eyes. In other words, clearing out our own inner emotional issues. And then we see other people clearly because until we do that, we see everybody through the dark lens of our negative self-limiting beliefs. Okay, so assignment number one, start paying attention to your feelings. And when you have a feeling and your, your impulse is to either shove it down or blame it on somebody else, meaning somebody else has to change to make that feeling go away. No, they do not. The only person who has to change to make any feeling go away inside of you is you. You have the power to change every feeling that you feel without anybody else having to change at all. But you have to confront the feeling and own it. It's your feeling. It's like one of the authors that I read, Anthony DeMello said, okay, you go into the doctor and you say, doctor, I'm depressed. I need help. And he says, oh, great. I'll give your wife some medicine. 
You go, but 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 I'm the one who's sick. Okay. Well, it's the same thing when you're angry. It's the same thing when you're sad. It's the same thing when you're afraid. You're the one who's sick. It's not anybody else. Nobody else needs the medicine. You're the one who needs the medicine. You're the one who needs the savior. You're the one who needs someone to rescue you from that negative feeling that you're stuck in. Got it? So you start paying attention to how you feel and you start owning it. You start acknowledging, this is what I feel. And then the second thing is, you go, you start noticing the thoughts that are linked to those feelings. Because all negative emotions are linked to self-limiting negative beliefs. And at that point, you can then go to God and ask him to help you. And he can change that, giving you a new belief that will have a new emotion attached to it. And the emotion that God will always give you is one of peace, love, happiness, and joy. If your thought is in alignment with God, it will produce nothing but peace, happiness, love, and joy. Your negative emotions come because you're out of harmony with God's mind and will. And the negative emotion is telling you that you're sick and you need to go back to God. Your negative emotion is telling you that you're sick and you need to go back to God. Because God is the only one who can bring you back to peace, love, happiness, and joy. So the emotions are important because they tell us that something inside of us needs to be healed. And until we're willing to acknowledge that we got a problem, God can't save us. Because you have to recognize you need to be saved before you can ask for help. That's my message for tonight. So I'm going to just look at the, we've got a chat here on this thing. So if anybody has any uh, thing that they would like to, uh, you know, ask some questions, I'll be happy to address um, the questions. Um, some people report a few uh, um, sound problems. I, I'm sure that happens once in a while because uh, this isn't perfect. Hopefully, though, the recording will be perfect. And if you, you can get the recording, I hope all of you also got the message, the email, that there is a class resource page. Um, uh, for uh, I, I actually posted a little, a little thing of the story of my first emotional healing experience that I wrote up years ago that you can read. Uh, and I also will be posting other things, as well as there's a forum, because I, I would love for you if you apply some of this material in your own life and you have a good experience with it to share that on the forum with other people um, or if you have questions to discuss it with other people so we can get uh, a community going here of, of people helping to support each other um, in this work. I also want to remind you that um, the ability to um, uh, put forth these classes, um, you know, is totally dependent uh, uh, I need you know if you have the ability to give a, a donation to the class um, help with the class that would be really great um, so forth but you don't have to because this is you know I'm putting this out here because I want to help people now and I and by the way I, I want to tell you one thing I never ever in my life have ever charged people to do this work never I knew from the beginning, that you can't make people pay for something that God is giving you as a gift. You can't charge for it. You have to give it away. I've had people give me money before for it, and I've actually given it, I've actually taken that and given it to other causes. And I, that's why another reason why I realized if I was going to do this right, I have to go teach this for free. I have to tell people that they need to do this for free because you can't make a spiritual gift uh, 
a commodity. You can't sell the gifts of God. Okay? All right. I don't see anybody asking any questions. So I, I was everybody like uh, thinking, actually, I, I did open a donation. I, the, where, where I have the sign up at treelight.com for this class, I put in the ability to do donations. Also on the in, inner class, um, um, if you go in and log into our online learning center, right at the top, by the forums, there's a button to go donate on Facebook, and you could also, you know, call us and and make a donation. Um, and and I th and I will put the links for the donation stuff at the bottom of all of the videos too, um, so you can review them if you want to look at that. Okay, uh, come. Um, you know, I, I I did for a while offer an emotional healing course that I was charging people for, and um, and I did this you know, because I was teaching more of the secular application of all this, and I decided I really need to teach the the thing. So this is way different from the online emotional healing course. Now, a couple of the other modules I'm going to do will, I'll extract stuff from the old emotional healing course. Um, there is no homework. There's obviously no handouts, but there are, like I said, some um, additional resources and information that you could download if you go to our uh, Moodle um, Page. And I sent out an email with, uh, there's a link to a video that tells you how to register. If you went in and tried to register and it asked for a, a password or something, I disabled that so you can basically um, log in. Ah, see, this is a really good question. What if an individual doesn't feel worthy to go to God and ask him to help with a new belief? See, that's that's exactly the kind of issue I'm talking about. Because I have encountered this over and over again, and I'll tell stories about this, uh, how, how people, when they got into their emotional stuff, they, um, they were afraid to go to God because, because you feel that you know, you're unworthy and whatever. And, and I have an entire webinar in this class devoted to that exact issue, okay? And it will... It will um, uh, help you do with this, but you, you, uh, I just try to, I just try to say, you know, go, go, be, encourage people to go, because we're all like the prodigal son, we've all strayed, and in our heart we know we've strayed away from our loving father, and we're kind of afraid to go back because we know we've screwed up, right? That's that's the position. What what you want to need to understand is that's what I've over and over and over again found is the position of all mankind right? All mankind. And yes, you can watch this at another time. This is being recorded. It will be posted on Facebook. There will also be a link to it uh, in the class class page. Um, uh, you know, I would rather if, uh, rather than donate, if you joined our member program, let me, let me go ahead and see if I can um, um, just pull up here really quickly and see if I could share it. Um, um, Uh, if uh, let's see, can I share this? Um, I'm going to turn the webcam off. Going to turn screen sharing on, and then I'm going to switch windows here, and I'm going to go to this. Okay, I hope people can see the the window I that I'm sharing now. Uh, this is stephenhorn.com. And if you just go here and you, um, I'll log out really quickly. And then um, if you do become a member, th this is actually would be the greatest way to support us is just become a member of our member program. Um, uh, I, that would be really, really appreciated. Um, I'm going to come back to here. And I, I also, let me go here. Um, websites. Okay, if you go to um, modernherbalmedicine.com LMS, um, I gave the little um, YouTube video about how to um, uh, log into this. If you've taken a class from us before, all you have to do is enter your old username and password. If you haven't taken a class from us before, 
um, you actually can um, uh, register um, here, create a new account. And then once you've created an account, um, if you uh, use your username and password and you log in, you'll be able to find the um, uh, class page. And this is a little bit slow right now, but you go over here um, on the right-hand side, it says 2018 Emotional Healing Training Program. And the first course, which is the one we're in, is right here. I'll be adding all of those uh, the other four modules here. And you click on this, and it will show you the uh, uh, link to donate on PayPal, the, uh, the social forum, and the student discussion forum. And then this is lesson one. And I, I um, posted a couple of things that you can read with this lesson. And I will also post an audio and video recording of the webinar um, there as well. All right, with that, I will turn screen sharing back off and turn it back to webcam. So like I said, I sent out, um, I do agree that people have to make changes to the things that they do and consume in order to heal. But, but I'm gonna say one thing, why, why when we know we should make those changes, do we not make those changes? And the answer is because of our unresolved emotional wounds. So a lot of times we can't make those changes by our own willpower because there's something inside of us that's sabotaging us. And that's what emotional healing is all about. People will find it easier to make those changes when they process the negative things that um, prevent them. Like, like for me, motivating myself to exercise required me to do some emotional healing work because I was very awkward and uncoordinated as a kid. I hated gym in high school. So going to work out at the gym was like dredging up all these painful memories from my teenage years. And I had to process through them in order to be able to get past that and be able to feel okay about going to the gym. See, this is true of all people with all the things that we need to do to heal. We know there are things we should be doing, but we don't do them because of our unresolved emotional wounds. Because when we go to do them, we experience this emotional pain that blocks us from doing them because we don't like to do things that feel painful. And so you have to go in and find out where the belief is that's attached to that painful emotion and get help to shift it. And a lot of times they'll shift very naturally. Um, I am not confusing eternal salvation from saving us from emotions. I am talking about the fact that, that the idea of, of being saved in the next life, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, but what I'm saying is that there's a power that Christ has to save us now from the troubles we're in now in this life, not just in the hereafter, not just to take us to heaven, but to actually help us with our problems right now. So I'm not confusing the two. I'm just explaining that all too often we think of the one, but we don't really trust that right here, right now, that we can have God help us with the problems that we have. Um, on the, the video will be on YouTube um, when we're done. Um, Someone said, I have a problem with organized religion. I trust this God-based, not religion. Yes, absolutely, because I don't belong to any organized church, so I'm not, gonna try to tr I'm not trying to convert anybody to any religion. Whatever religion you have and whatever religious beliefs you have, that's fine. In fact, I should have said from the very beginning, I'm not trying to convert anybody to anything. I'm sharing my experiences. Consider it. Think about it. Meditate on it. What is good for you, take away. What isn't good for you, don't. I'm not the end all and be all authority on spiritual matters. I'm merely sharing my own personal experience and journey. And I'm sharing spiritual principles, not religious teachings. And the, the use of flower essences actually will be discussed in a later module. They can be helpful for helping people get ready to work through problems. Uh, they were not gonna be, they're not going to be discussed in, in this particular first module. Oh, someone said the original biblical language for salvation means saved past, present, future, all areas. Good. All right. In other words, <laughs> salvation, is, all I'm trying to say is salvation doesn't have to be something you're waiting for in the hereafter. Salvation can happen now 
and rescue you out of the circumstances that you're in right now. Okay, someone says they tend to feel numb. You, when you're numb, it's because you have a lot of emotional pain that you've deeply suppressed. And so most people are numb. Most people are numb. Most people can't even answer the question, how do you feel? Because we're so ingrained to suppress all of our feelings that we, that we don't even know how we feel. And so that's part of the problem. And we're going to talk about that a little later on um, too. Um, let's see. Someone says, noticing the thoughts linked to the emotions. I heard once to notice the feeling and then ask ourselves, what was I just thinking? Yeah, that's that's just it. Notice the thinking that's attached to the feeling. Because I guarantee that, that whenever you're suffering emotionally, the thoughts you're thinking are not true. Because if they were true, they would bring you peace and love and joy and whatever. Every time, every time God has told me even something that might could be considered painful or difficult that's going to happen. Like I, I had a dream that my father was going to pass away very soon. But I woke up from that dream with a feeling of peace and reassurance and love. God does not communicate anything in a spirit of fear or a spirit of anger or a spirit of communicates in a spirit of love and peace. So if you find yourself thinking things and it's disturbing your soul, it's not from God. Okay. Um, someone said, I've been learning several of these things a few years and healing my life. It's been amazing. Thanks for sharing this stuff. You're very, very welcome. Um, Oh, someone else said they were trying to lose weight and knew that it was the unresolved emotions that were blocking them. And yes, we will, we will cover that. I mean, like I said, this is what this first module is about. I'm going to can get into more details about how all this works and, and how all this, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, operates and more of the spiritual principle behind us in the future webinar. So um, I want to keep these to an hour. So we, we're, uh, we're out of time. I appreciate your watching. I appreciate your comments. Please feel free to log into the online learning center, sign up for the class. If you need help, you can call our toll-free number 800-416-2887. It's 800-416-2887. And we'll help you with it. Or email me at webinars at treelight.com. And we'll help you, um, you know, get logged in, send you the link to the video or whatever to show you how to get logged in. Um, and that will um, uh, allow you to discuss this and ask questions. And I can make comments to everybody and everybody can read them. And this will really, really help. Again, um, the, the, you don't have to register. If you registered once, you're registered for the entire webinar series. And the next um, webinar in the series actually is next week at the same time on Mondays. Um, and we will get into the next lesson on this. So thank you for watching. And um, we'll uh, hopefully get to talk to you again next week. Good night.